Okay, we're going to start lecture 18 of ROB 101. As promised, we are going to look into vector valued functions in the context of nonlinear, solving nonlinear equations. We covered methods for solving single variable functions. We learned two methods. One was bisection and one was Newton's method for finding a real root of a function. Now we're gonna extend the idea of a slope and derivatives to multivariable or multivariate, or we can say vector valued functions, functions that might take vector and gives you, typically we refer vector valued functions to functions that gives vectors as output. And the next time we will see how we can find roots of vector valued functions. That will be Newton Raphson method. That's a vectorized version of Newton's method. So today we're going to learn how to calculate a generalization of a slope, something we will call a Jacobian matrix as a rate of change along different directions, and we'll see how this works. Our objectives are not changed. We will look into a generalized version of linear approximations of nonlinear functions. Now this idea will stay with you in many courses in engineering. A lot of times you are facing a nonlinear problem. Our first attempt is usually to approximate that linear nonlinear function locally at the current operating point with a linear model. Then we are very good at sol solving linear systems, as we covered in this course. Now, what was the essence of Newton's method? Can somebody point out, if you remember from last time, what was the core idea? To summarize what we learned, also motivate why we're going to talk about linear approximation. Oh, sorry, I haven't shared my screen on Zoom. And I haven't written anything. All right. Yeah, go ahead, man. It's like finding um, the tangent line at like a certain point that your destination might be close to the root, and then based on uh, like what the slope of that is, then kind of like adjusting and just trying to get successively closer until you find um, like. Uh, horizontal, or no, sorry, not horizontal. Um, and then, like, oh, it has to, oh, you find the intercept, right? Um, right. Until you get, like, to the root. Okay, that was a good summary. I'll repeat it so everybody can hear. So we have a function. We want to come up with an idea to successively search or iteratively search for finding the root. The idea was that at the current point, or the current operating point, wherever we are, that could be initially using a guess, and assuming that our guess is good enough, it's not very far, we find a tangent line to our function at that point, then we find the intersection with the x-axis, where the line becomes zero, that will give us the next point, right? And then we repeat that, keep repeating that, and eventually, for a nice problem that we studied, the function is continuous and differentiable and all of that, we could find the solution. So the essence of that was to find a line that is tangent to your function at that point, right? Then find the uh, interception with the x-axis where it becomes zero, and then use that as your guess for the next step. 
So linearization is at the core of it. Iteration is also at the core of it because when we fit a line or find a line that is tangent to your function, that's an approximation to the true function. We are not capturing everything. So we, the idea of iteration is that repeat this process so eventually you get closer and closer to the solution. Now, for this particular algorithm, there is no guarantee in general you find a solution, right? In a course on algorithms, they, they care about this. Maybe some algorithms have guarantee. You're guaranteed to find a solution. And sometimes there's no guarantee. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. For Newton, if you are sufficiently, and that's very vague because in a real problem, how would you know, right? then you will find the solution. But regardless, in practice, we use it a lot, so it is useful. Now, we are facing a problem here. If we are going to talk about tangent line, how we're going to talk about a tangent line when our function has multiple outputs, it's a vector. Maybe it takes a vector, right? Do something, gives you a vector. What does it mean to talk about a tangent line? So, two problems. What does it mean? What is the best ap linear approximation of a nonlinear function at a point? And what does it mean to talk about slope? of a vector-valued function. So for a one-dimensional example, the linear approximation is clear. It's a line, right? By definition, it's a line. Now, what is the best slope? This comes from calculus. Right? You're not assuming a knowledge of it. We talked about how to approximate the slope. The derivative of a function, its rate of change, right? Its rate of change better pen. So we approximated this with something like delta of f over delta of x, right? A delta that you move up, right, divided by the delta you move down, it corresponds to the slope of the line. What is the best slope at a point? That comes from calculus. That's the derivative of a function. So we want to approximate that. So we have an idea of what is the best slope. An equation of a line is like this. Y x0 and y0 is where you are. x0 is along the x-axis. y0 is the actual value of your function at that point. So this is x0 and y0. A, or we used m, Sometimes in previous lectures, uh, previous slides, it doesn't matter. So A, here is a scalar, that's the slope of the line. So the linear approximation of your function is essentially defined to be what you see here. a line that is a slope equals to the derivative of function at that point. That is the best linear approximation you can get for a continuous and differentiable function. I'll talk about what does it mean differentiable. 
You're not supposed to know if you haven't taken calculus. So that makes the problem easier because we have an idea of what is the best linear approximation, but of course, we don't know how good of an approximation to our function this might be. We're gonna see an example and one idea to evaluate um, if this is a good approximation of our function or not. And just to be very precise, this part is called linear. The whole thing is called affine. But when we talk about linear approximation, that's what we mean. You, you have a constant here plus a linear, a line that goes through the origin, right? So, so if somebody asks you to, I give you this nonlinear function, linearize it. That's what you do, right? We want to solve a problem. We say that we first linearize our function. That's what we mean. We find the best linear approximation to that function, again, at the current operating point. This is not everywhere, right? Because as you move, the value of a slope will change. This depends on where you are. If it would be constant, then the function would be a line to begin with, right? So it, it will be variable. We covered this as well. I'm summarizing the finite difference approximation to the derivative, we do not want to calculate analytical derivatives and going down the calculus path. We want to do a computational version of that. The classic way to approximate the derivative is called finite, finite difference method. Now there are three ideas, one is forward difference, move a delta here, small value h, forward, subtract it from the value of function at where you are, divided by your delta h, that's called forward difference. Backward difference idea says that evaluate your function where you are minus the value of your function when you move a delta back here h step back. You can think about h as delta x. Symmetric or central difference, which usually gives a better result, combines both of these, these ideas. So move a delta forward, move a delta backward, and divide it by two delta. This is usually better. Okay, question is, if the function is actually differentiable, sounds like you know calculus, do people actually use these methods in practice? Yes, more often than actually calculating a derivative. Why? Because it's not always the case that you're after the derivative of function. It's usually the case that the derivative is part of something else that you want to calculate. Maybe part of an algorithm that you want to iterate, or maybe part of a differential equation, maybe you, you will see in a differential equation course that you want to calculate, and this will give you a discrete version of that. A nice property of this method find a difference that's heavily used in mechanics and a lot of uh, field that they deal with solving 
numerical solutions to differential equations like fluid mechanics, heat transfer, control theory, when they want to solve optimal control problem. The nice thing about this is that you can convert a continuous time process because the derivative, it's defined at one specific point, and you don't know it because you need to calculate it analytically. Whereas when you use the finite difference, this is a time difference in a sense equation or position difference here. This is very suitable for computers. Digital computers allows you to implement this one, but this one, right, you just don't know how to do it unless you have the solution. Now, what are the pros and cons? But if you know the exact solution, obviously your problem is so much simpler and usually it's faster. Right, if H is small enough, it is very close to the actual derivative. Now if it's a simple problem, right, a small, and you can calculate it, that's usually not, again, a problem. But if you're working with a giant problem, 10, your function is giving you 10 outputs and it's nonlinear, it's very time consuming to do a do calculation by hand. Besides, you might have a library that is implemented in general to compute a numerical uh, derivative of any function, right? Then you just define your function and then you can solve the problem, which is what we do today. That's very convenient. So it is very used, in, uh, used a lot in practice. However, not just a warning that this is not how modern um, libraries, for example, for deep learning, they compute derivative, right? They use something that is good to learn after this. It's a little more advanced. It's called computational graphs and automatic differentiation. It's not this. Example. Our function is the absolute value of x. We want to explain why this is not differentiable. Okay, I can explain it here already that without any knowledge of calculus, when I say differentiable, you should think about a function that is a smooth. There is no sharp edges, right? Precondition to be differentiable means it's continuous. Continuous was for us, put your pen on the paper, draw your function without lifting it. If you can do that, it's continuous. It is differentiable if there's no sharp edges in your curve. This is a sharp edge here, right? So smooth means it's continuous and differentiable, which differentiable means it's continuous. But of course, you can talk about these concepts at a particular point as well. That you might ask the question, for example, here, whether the function is differentiable at x0 equals 0, at the origin. It is differentiable everywhere else. It's a line. Now, to give you an idea why it's not differentiable, when you calculate forward, backward, and central differences, you get three different answers. The way from the direction that you approach that point, it changes the value of the derivative. And a calculus course, they say that left and right derivatives or limits are not equal, then the function is not differentiable at that point. So the hint for not being differentiable is that you're getting different values, right? Everything falls apart, right? If you don't have that, then you cannot talk about um, those best linear approximation using the derivative because it's not well-defined. 
Okay, so imagine it for yourself that you are approaching to the origin from different directions. You, don't, you get different values and answers. We don't want that. We want to get the same answer no matter what direction you're approaching to that point. Here is 1D, it can be higher dimensional, same concept applies. Okay, let's generalize our function to a map that transform a vector that belongs to Rm. That means x is an m vector, a default column vector. Our function takes this x, it gives you a value such as y, and y is now an n vector. What is the best linear approximation of this function? Of course, when m and n are all are both one, this is just the line we talked about, right? So the line is a special case of this case. Now, for a general case, intuitively, what do we need? What would be an equation, equivalent of a nonlinear function, that describes that describe, uh, our model, F? Now, we know that regardless of what you do, an approximation to this function it, it still needs to be a map from Rm to Rn, right? If it's not, then it's not describing the same process. Okay, does that make sense? It, it still needs to take an m vector and give you an n vector. So that is a precondition. So far, we've seen this equation many times, A, X. If X is the input and is M by one, right? And Y is N by one, then A must be what? There is no other choice, A must be an N by M matrix, right? There is no other option. So, following the same pattern we had, if we have a matrix that acts as this generalized notion of slope, Right? We can generalize this equation, one here to two, by saying that we still need to take the difference because we, wanna, we want to do this approximation at where we are. That's why we evaluate our function. Take your delta x, x minus x zero, wherever you are. Then we multiply a by that vector the output will be n vector. And this is called linear approximation of your function in the case that it takes a vector, it gives you a vector for any dimension. And then the question is, how do you compute A, right? And that's what we want to answer. So is everybody clear? Do you have any question where this matrix comes from? 
changing it to RM, like what is the, so you have a vector that's like, let's say in like three dimensions, mm -hmm. and then the goal is just to approximate it in let's say two dimensions or something? Exactly, so let me find some, For example, in consider a case where F maps takes two inputs, right? A two vector and maps it to a real number. You can write this as Z equals F of X and Y. This can be surface, right? What is the best linear approximation of, let's say, imagine this point is on the surface. What is the best linear approximation of this nonlinear, because it's not moving in a linear way, linear approximation of this surface at that point? What does it look like, the shape of it? It's a plane, exactly. So it's going to be a plane, it's not a line. So the notion of that line in one dimension higher, right, is going to be a plane. Which we will see examples of this type of function today. Yeah, if you take just, um, let's say x, y, x, z, whatever plane, right? If you just talk about z, f of x, now assuming this is a function, right? Then you are just talking about a curve and a line, tangent line. If it's a surface, it's a plane. You go to higher dimensions, it's a hyperplane. We cannot visualize it. But like in, in the case that you wrote with the surface, um, like if you're condensing from R2 to just R, then like wouldn't, like isn't the plane, the plane would be in R2 also? Because it's like two, to, or it has two dimensions to it rather than, or, or it's a plane, like planes are in R2, I guess, but then like how could you have a plane in just R? That's exactly what we want to cover. You're saying the plane is in R2. How can it be in 3D? Because your function has two inputs. Then you ask, the, you ask the question that what is the rate of change of your function with respect to any of these, in, these inputs, right? If this is x, this is y, then you can talk about rate of change along this direction, rate of change along this direction, right? Two vectors will give you the plane because the cross product of these two vectors is the normal of the plane, right? Now we're not going to do that, but in this 3D case, geometrically, we can talk about it. So the question we ask is the same. When you had a curve, we ask the question that what is the rate of change of my function at that point, right, along the x-axis? What is the rate of change of my function along the x-axis? In this case, you want to ask the question of rate of change of your function along each independent direction in the space. Right? So based on how many variables your functions depend on, dimension of the domain, you get directions to evaluate the rate of change. Now it can become a little more complicated because your function can map to 3D space. Then we, the bookkeeping is going to go crazy. It's going to be crazy, right? So you, now you have to think about F1, F2, F3. 
think about each of them as such function that we talked about, we talked about, right? Then talk about, about each of f1, f2, f3 as the rate of change with respect to independent directions in the input. So many things to track, right? So, so like if this was an example where it was going like R2 to R3 and you have the same, then like you would output, like, would it be like three different vectors like in the x, y, and z direction? You could think about each of the outputs as a surface, right? That's what you can, you can think about it. As usual with the other topics in linear algebra, it's only limited number of problems we can visualize, right? We're going to resort to algebra and more abstract calculations. So it is still about rate of change along a particular direction. It's just, it is generalized to multivariate or multivariable case. So a function that maps from a domain to a vector, this is called a vector valued function. Now you're, you're not going to see vector valued function in the first course in calculus, but usually after the first course, the second course or third course is about multivariate or multivariable calculus. Then they talk about vector functions and generalization of that. Now, if this is, of course, it's in use and it's very common in engineering. It's, de it's been developed in the past 100, 120 years ago. That, um, if you look back in the history of mathematics, there was an interesting video on Piazza Jesse shared. Any of you watched it? Nobody had time. <laughs> it was fun. I opened it and I couldn't stop just watching the whole thing. When math was all about solving quadratic and cubic equation, and mathematicians could challenge each other, I could, for example, challenge Jesse <laughs> to become the director of robotics by giving 30 problems, and he could give me 30 problems and see who can win. Then I could claim the position. <laughs> I don't know if that's a doable concept in today, but it was very hard. You had to be really good to keep your position. And all they had to do was to solve the cubic equation. Watch it, it's fun. You will learn that imaginary numbers are real. <laughs> that's the conclusion. Okay, so the input vector right now is R in Rm. If you remember from previous lectures, we can write any vector in Rm as basically a linear combination of your entries or coordinates times standard basis of Rm. The standard basis of Rm, you had your identity matrix, right? Because Im times any x would give you x, and you could write it like this. So it is very convenient to think about those directions that we talk about rate of change to be the standard basis, because they are already orthogonal, they point to independent directions, and easy to work with. <laughs> 
So it is very interesting that our linear algebra knowledge of partitioning a matrix into columns and thinking about column space of our matrix comes to play here, and you can see each column of that matrix A can be approximated using, using this notion of essentially delta, right? Function can be a vector. It is not, it's not important, right? So take the function, take its delta. I'm using central difference here. You can use anything you like. You could, you could do forward or backward. Calculate its rate of change with respect to that particular direction. The first column of your identity matrix, the first standard basis, you call it I because for an arbitrary column, you calculate delta F divided by del delta X for that particular direction. Now delta X, just be careful by delta X, I don't mean vector X, right? I mean the particular entry coordinates, delta for that direction. So that gives you each column of A. I don't expect it to be super clear, but when we do numerical examples, hopefully it gets better. That is true. It was N from last year. <laughs> and I changed it to M, I missed this. So there's a typo. This should be x, n. A very special case is when your function takes an m vector and maps it to a real number. We call that matrix A in this case, the gradient of your function, your matrix will become a row vector. Because your function only have one, it only has one output, when you get its delta, it's only a scalar, okay? And then you do for each column of A, right? You do this for each column of A along each of these directions, so you end up with a row vector. This row vector is called the gradient. The notations are different, but these are universally agreed on. You can use nabla or del symbol. And you can also write grad, that means gradient, not to be confused with grad students. <laughs> you can click on, let's see, I think I put a hyperlink. You can read about, you need to the symbol novel on Wikipedia. Panel is coming from the instrument. And you read some history, people were ashamed of using it in formal writing. I don't know why, but it is a very cool symbol and we, we like it. And Dell is another name for the same operator, Gibbs, um, famous American 
engineer, mathematician, or physicist. He used, uh, he was also one of the responsible people for de developing vector calculus. Gibbs was at Yale. He used the name Dell for this operator. You will see this a lot in a multivariate calculus course. So th this nabla or del f, you can read it as this, it means the gradient of f. You can, or you can just say the gradient of f. A general case, when f gives you multiple outputs and outputs, you will have n rows and m columns. We call this matrix the Jacobian of F. So Jacobian of F refers to the entire matrix. So when you speak, you can say derivative, we might think about the scalar. When you say gradient, we think about a vector. It's understood that the function gives you one output. When you say Jacobian, we think about a function that takes a vector and gives you a vector as the output. But it is not wrong to say derivative to all of them or Jacobian to all of them. So think about each column of, to summarize, think about each column of the Jacobian matrix A as the rate, and rate of change of your function along that particular direction. Column I shows the rate of change of your function along EI. If your function is vector valued, it shows the rate of change of each of the outputs along EI. So it is the same concept, but we are not going to visualize it. Okay, let's look into an example. Give you a very complicated function. It is no fun to Calculate the derivative by hand. Now, a question for you is what are the values of m and n? What's the dimension of the domain? What's the dimension of the range? of the function. Anybody in chat, in Zoom, in class? Four. <laughs> Four is not the answer. Should do this, we asked 100, undergrad, what's the dimension of the domain? <laughs> See, what's the top answer here? <laughs> if it's wrong, then they must take it up on a one. <laughs> That's correct, M is three. What is N? Say it again. Number of rows. Number of rows here, right? Yes, that's a reasonable way to count the number of outputs. So the function is vector valued, right? So, well, if it's a vector, just count the number of rows. That's how many outputs you're getting each time. So m is three, uh, the way we know is three because we look at the function, we have x1, x2, x3, right? We don't see x4 or five, so that must be it. So M is three, also N is three, 
because our function is a three vector. Now, this is unlike linear vectors, right? x1, x2, x3. This is very complicated. The function takes three variables, it mixes them up in a very complicated way and spits out some numbers. At any point, you can evaluate this. You get a three vector. So, m is the number of the approach function, and n is the number of variables that are in the function. m is the number of variables, right, in the domain, right? n is the number of outputs. This pen is not good. M is the number of inputs. N is the number of outputs. But we put it in a vector, so the function is vector valued. Yes? Can you please repeat? When the number of input Yes, yes. The question is if the number of outputs will be the number of rows. Yes, that's the simple way to think about it. But for the number of inputs, you need to see how many independent variables you take, right? So we want to evaluate the Jacobian of this function at a point x0. It takes It is understood that this is x1, x2, x3, right? These are x1, x2, x3 that you see on, on, in the above equations. So at a particular point, when x takes pi 1 and 2, we want to evaluate the Jacobian. We also want to talk about the accuracy of our linear approximation. Now, first of all, before even attempting to solve this, you should be able to say, what is the dimension of the Jacobian? What's the dimension of A? Three by three. That means it has three column, right? What's the meaning of each column? Uh, the first one is like the rate of change in like the e one direction. The second is the rate of change in two and third is three. Right, exactly. The first one is the rate of change along the standard first the standard basis e one, and we consider that for x one, right? because the input is x1, x2, x3. And if you remember, we can write this as xi, ei, right? OK, so the second one is the rate of change of our vector valued function along e2, and so on. Now, take the first column, for example. Now, this column itself has three elements, right? One, 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 two, one, three. How do you interpret these three variables? A2, one. A3, one. Oh. <laughs> Well, that explains why there was no answer. <laughs> we always give the student the benefit of the doubt. 
derivative of the first equation in, in the e1 direction, in the x1 direction, I guess? Yes, that's what it is. If you read the book, that means you've read the book. Uh, we talk about partial derivatives, partial knowledge of part of your function with respect to part of the inputs, right? So you could talk about the derivative of your f1, f2, f3, right? So the partial derivative of partial knowledge or rate of change of f1 with respect to rate uh, with respect to x1 will give you a11. That's what you get. For a21, it's the rate of change of f2 with respect to still x1, right? The first column, the entire first column is about x1. The entire second column is about x2. So you could talk about each of the entries as partial derivatives, rate of change, and connect them from input to output like this. I will write it here for you that now the derivative of f with respect to x, we use d as the symbol when it's on, there's only one variable because this is the entire knowledge that you can get, right? Rate of change of f with respect to x. But when you have multiple variables, right, we use this notation, partial derivative of f with respect to x1, partial derivative of f with respect to x2. When you have, now the way we approximate them is the same thing, right? That we talked about the scalar functions. But the notation is a hint to say that x1 is not the only variable. This is only part of the total variations of our function. Of course, you can have multiple f, then you can talk about rate of change of F1 with respect to X1 and X2, or rate of change of F2 with respect to X1 and X2. Now, you're already getting a headache probably because it's going to be F2, it's going to be F3, it's going to be X1, 2, 3, 4, 5. But generally speaking, the Jacobian has this structure of So take your vector valued function, right? Evaluate the derivative, a rate of change of each of the entries of your function with respect to x, just like the way we did last time for scalar functions. That will give you the first column. So it is going to be like this, and these are columns of A. But you can just abstract it in your matrix and talk about column. In, your, in the code, you will see we, we can actually process data in Julia as column or matrix. Now it's important to understand what's each of the entry, but we might not work it out a single number at a time. 
So that's the structure that we'll give you, uh, you the Jacobian. Okay, in this example, we use a central difference. The first column is what you see, two, zero, one. The second column is another numeric value. And the third column is, again, another numeric value. So my matrix A is, again, for constructed by stacking these vectors. Now, next thing is I want to write the linear approximation of my function. So the linear approximation of my function, as you know, it will be your function evaluated at the point that we are operating at, plus the Jacobian times x minus x zero. Now, what's the only variable in this linear approximation? From this side, balance the participation. Take a guess, say. What is the only variable here in this line? And this, this. You have the correct answer on chat, x, right? So x0 is known. A is also a matrix of numbers. You know it. So x is the only variable. So the linear approximation, take any value x, right, and gives you one, another vector here, a three vector as the output. Now, it is a fair question to ask, which if you write it down, you see um, what we have here. It takes three inputs, gives you another three outputs. How good is this approximation, right? We can't just approximate a function and call it a day. It might be important to know if it's good or bad. So here is one idea. Define the error to be the norm of your actual function. We have the actual function. We can evaluate it. It's difference with the linearized version. So this is going to be a three vector, the real function minus the linearized version. Then consider a set where for each of the variables you search in a small radius, right? For example, wherever you are, for each direction, just search for a small radius to um, a small neighborhood. Call it D. Then find the maximum error. What's the maximum error you make if you search along each direction and then see how much error you make. Now, this is a, the detail of this is a great topic for the lab. We trust what Jesse implemented. <laughs> so what he did, he implemented a random sampler. So you draw a random sample within that interval set S, and then evaluated the error, right? Using a computer, he repeated that for some number of samples, 10, 100, 1,000. Now you have a vector of errors, right? So out of that vector of errors, take the maximum of it using max function. Then they will, this will give you max error. So you, you see that we use the same optimization notation, but implementation is actually um, Evaluate many times, create a vector of errors, right? And then take the max. It's not just one line or one function. Again, this is a notation. This was a maximization problem to find the maximum error. I leave the details for the lab, but if you 
do the random search within D equals 0 0.25, you get 1.5% error, which is not too bad, okay? Now, it is very interesting to have that code and you increase this radius, to play with the radius and see how far it's good, right? What if this D was one? What if it's two? And you can actually plot this, right? So you can generate a plot D, maybe percentage of the error, right? And then when these are small, probably the error is very small. And then you get something like this. <laughs> maybe it's like this. Maybe it's better. <laughs> it's definitely not like this. <laughs> All we know that as you increase D, you're going to get more and more error. Right? Unless you change redo the linearization at the new point where you are. Um, if our function, or if we're mapping like from uh, RM to RN and they're not the same, um, how would like the error work? Because like you'd be subtracting like f of x minus f of x, but they'd be at different dimensionalities. Right? They don't, because the Jacobian here. Oh, because either way, up and Yeah, up. yeah. Okay, so it's true that x, this part, it's a good question, that this part is an m vector, right? However, a times x minus x zero, because this is n by m, is an n vector. So there is no problem, actually. It works out for any dimension. That's a natural confusion, so that comes up always. Okay, so now let's go take a look at the code. I'm gonna give you a Jacobian function. You can cherish it for a very long time. <laughs> It is already implemented in a very general case. Let me see. Now, I, again, I gave you the notebooks. They're on Canvas. Notebook, so there's only one. And I'm running it locally. You can upload it on um, IllumiDesk, or you can run it also locally. If you would like to run it locally and you are struggling with installing Julia, you can just ask it on Piazza and we can help you. Where is my code? All right, so. The first part I'm just summarizing, right? They're computing the numerical der derivative. Fortunately, I can fix it here. This should be M. This is my, can you see it? Yeah. This is my general Jacobian function. I call it Jacobian, but it does give you the derivative of a scalar function. It does give you the gradient. So it doesn't matter. Let's see how I'm doing this. So I'm using linear algebra package, as usual. My Jacobian function, what it does, it takes an object that is any function, right? So I don't want to write my Jacobian for a specific function, so I assume that we will pass a function as object later. So this is my function. You pass the object of the function without parentheses. 
x0 is my operating point, wherever I want to evaluate the Jacobian. h is the step size. I'm setting a default value. In all the examples, I'm not changing it, but you can change it, of course. So the Jacobian is for a function that maps from Rm to Rn. First, I take the length of x0. This will give me m, so I know how many inputs I have. Then I evaluate my function and take the length of f0, my function evaluated at x0. This will tell me how many outputs I have. Is there a better way to do it? I couldn't come up with. Because <laughs> it's nice if you don't evaluate a function, but that's the obvious way to get the number of outputs. Now, we don't want to go too, so too crazy if the function is a scalar, right? We don't want to bother with directions and all of the loops. It's not necessary. Make the co code complicated. So I'm going to handle the case when I have only one input, right? Because there is no other direction. It's just the delta movement in the input using this. However, I use dot for any operation because my function might have multiple outputs. Could be a vector, so plus and minus and division should respect that. So that dot is for the vectorized uh, version. So I'm going to return the central difference if I only have one input. And this will handle the vectorized version already. So if you have one input, multiple outputs, this will give you one column, right? It's the opposite of the gradient. When we had multiple inputs, one output, we give you a row. In else, any other case, if you have more than one input, construct the identity matrix, construct your, initialize your Jacobian with a zero matrix, then loop over the number of input, which will be the number of columns of my matrix. I grab EI, my current direction, and fill in the column, ith column of A, again using a central difference along the direction EI. This is very important. It's not just plus H h times that direction. In a generalized way in calculus, this is also related to something you call directional derivative, right? Because why ei, why not something else? You could actually use any direction, and that's called directional derivative. Later, maybe when you come across that, try to change this function to calculate the derivative for arbitrary direction. But for today, we are working with the standard basis. And that's it. Then we return A. Now, as far as I check for these examples, this works. You can play with more examples. Maybe you might need to modify something, but I don't think so. Now, I, next thing I have is a test block. How do you know the code is correct? Well, you need a test code. Something that you know the answer, and somehow you can check if your code is working correctly, as expected. My test code is a quadratic function, x transpose times a, a matrix x. So actually, it should be h. I changed the notation. So it takes a vector and gives me, gives me what? It's the quadratic function. It gives me a single output, right? X is 2 by 1. X transpose is 1 by 2 times a 2 by 2 matrix times 2 by 1. So it's a, F is a mapping from R2 to R. Now, I do know the exact gradient for this test. You can go to this website, Matrix Calculus. Uh, 
It will do it for you. This is very nice. If you have matrices, you want to calculate the derivative exactly, analytically, it will do it for you. So the actual gradient is 2 times h times x. The transpose is because I want to make it consistent. I want a row vector. I define my, this was f of x. I define my function to be f. I initialize a random two vector. And then I calculate my Jacobian by passing the function and initial guess. Then I also calculate the exact derivative. I define the error to be the difference between these two vectors and I print the norm of that error. I want that to be small. That's the test. Let's run. And see what we get. See, we, uh, so we can get the, I wasn't speaking Spanish. <laughs> Still English. The same we can see, um, Jacobian is a row vector. The actual gradient is also a row vector, and the error is very small. So this is a nice and smooth function. It's a quadratic equation. And the numerical derivative works really well. And not and this, this quadratic cost is also very common in optimization. We'll see it in quadratic programming. So we, our code passed the test. Some examples. I can run it again, too, because x0 is random. So if you run it again, you get different answers. So a simple example. My function is cosine of x. I want to evaluate its derivative at pi over 6. So this is just a simple derivative. One input, one output. And we know the derivative of cosine is negative of sine of x. So because we added that condition if, it will go through that one input and if you run this, you get the correct answer. Second example, my function takes x, a single input, and gives me two outputs. It takes x and gives me a two vector, cosine of x and sine of x. This is, of course, nonlinear. Still, I want to uh, calculate, calculate the derivative of the Jacobian at pi over 6. I define my function, f2 here. It's a vector of cosine of x and sine of x. I call my function to be f2. Define the initial guess. So every time I'm calling the same function, right? It's, nothing is changing. This is really nice. In your code, it looks the same thing. I'm just calling the same function, and I'm handling different cases inside the function. Because you don't want your function end up being a giant block of code to handle infinite number of cases. But if it's possible, that's very nice. What would be like a real-world example of, like, of this where you have one input that was restricted What is the real-world example of one input, two outputs? Yeah, we have to talk about manifolds, right? <laughs> so if you talk about, think about circles, and you're moving on the circle, right? So moving on, along that curve, you should think about that you have only have one dimension, right? If you live on the curve, right? You can only move along the curve. Then you can assign um, two vectors at any point, right, in the plane to that point, tangent to the curve, to the circle, and normal to the circle. If it's a car 
moving in a circle. In physics, you talk about um, acceleration, for example, in a tangent direction, in a normal direction, and so on. Another function for, uh, it takes, it's actually the same example in, uh, we had in the slides. It takes three inputs and gives you three outputs. I define my function F3. You see the first entry is X1 times X2 and X3 and so on. My function is F3. Again, I call it Jacobian. You can go back and check this matrix is exactly what I had in the slides. Now, it doesn't make any sense to you, but I copied that from the book. <laughs> but I calculated this myself, so we are in agreement. Your, your instructors are in agreement <laughs> in their coding. <laughs> There's no <laughs> discrepancy here. Now, this is already very complicated. I, I think the hand calculations of the derivative will be very annoying. annoying. <laughs> That's the right term. <laughs> Just because we can do it doesn't mean we want to do it. Now, what I'm doing, something um, somewhat interesting. So I'm cutting the last row of my function and making it a map from remove the last row, keep the same function. Now it's a map from R3 to R2. What do we expect? Do we expect the whole matrix to be different? If yes, why? If not, why? That's how I want to end the lecture to make sure. Again, we've defined a function, we calculate the Jacobian, and we see the previous case, the current case. All I did, I removed the last row of my vector valued function. Instead of three outputs, I have two outputs. I did not change anything else. Any guess? Should the Jacobian stay the same for the corresponding part? If yes, why? If no, again, why? Heavy silence. <laughs> so, the answer is, yes, it should be the same, it must be the same. Why? Because Jacobian is supposed to give the best linear approximation. It was the rate of change, right, from, uh, for each output to the input. So these, those partial derivatives, right, the first function with respect to the first variable, those are not going to change just because now we're removing a third output. So as a result of that, because I removed the last row of the output, basically the last row of the Jacobian is gone. But the first two rows are the same because I have two outputs, and I still have three inputs. So they are exactly the same. The first two rows are similar. You can go back to the partial derivatives that I wrote. Removing the last row of the output only removes that row because now F3 is essentially zero or it doesn't exist. So you don't have that row. So it is the best linear approximation, so it is going to be the same regardless, right? for each of these entries, if they exist, it remains the same. So that's uh, all for today. You can write your own function, play with this, 
let me know if you have any questions. And thanks for joining the lecture. And next time we will solve uh, the root finding problem for vector valid functions.